Hello students, I'm Imkong Tenlapungan from Department of Anthropology, University of Delhi. Today, I'm going to speak on the module Morbidity, Basic Concepts and Measures from the paper Demographic Anthropology. Well, the learning objectives of the module are to define morbidity and reproductive morbidity, to understand the models of morbidity analysis, to determine different measures of morbidity analysis, to distinguish between morbidity and mortality. Well, morbidity refers to the level of sickness and disability present in a population. The term morbidity and the road term morbid is derived from the word morbid from Latin language, which means disease. Though morbidity has a specific meaning in epidemiology, it is used in various other ways in the scientific community. The concept of morbidity has been the area of interest to human societies throughout history as people have tried very hard to understand sickness and death. Demographers by tradition focused on the study of mortality, which is considered to be the final result of morbidity and only recently has the emphasis shifted more towards morbidity. As stated that morbidity leads to mortality in most cases, it plays a greater role in shaping the nature of the society. Therefore, the interest in morbidity studies have increased manifold. In fact, the current concerns over disparities in health status among the elite and poor have attracted the attention of demographers and public health practitioners into this perspective. Morbidity may be used to refer to a person or a group. Morbidity as an individual's identity may refer to the health status of an individual, whereas while highlighting morbidity in group, it may be the health status of the specific group or population. Demographers are almost exclusively interested in morbidity associated with populations and very rarely study the morbidity of individuals thus there is a difference between individual that is clinical morbidity and group that is epidemiological morbidity however the situation where population level data is not available the unidentified health status of the individuals is considered Morbidity can be measured objectively through clinical tests or subjectively through self-reports by individuals. It is important to calculate the morbidity level of the total population under study. However, estimating the morbidity levels of the subsets within the population is equally necessary to understand the pattern of morbidity in that population. Now let us discuss reproductive morbidity in detail. Well, reproductive morbidity encompasses on the obstetric morbidity, which include conditions during pregnancy, delivery, and the postpartum period, while gynecological morbidity includes the conditions of the reproductive tract which are not associated with pregnancy, such as reproductive tract infections, cervical cell changes, prolapse, and infertility. Additionally, reproductive morbidity is also considered to cover relative morbidity concerns such as conditions of urinary tract infections, anemia, high blood pressure, obesity, and syphilis as a systemic condition. Here in this figure 1, we see conditions constituting of obstetric morbidity. Obstetric morbidity conditions are of public health interest because they are common and may have serious implications for maternal and child health. This table highlights during pregnancy, during delivery and postpartum period. In figure 2, we see a list of gynecological and related morbidity conditions. Determinants of reproductive morbidity. The first and realistic step towards policy making aimed at alleviating conditions of reproductive morbidity is to understand the determinants and their mechanisms for production of level of ill health. In analyzing 
the determinants of varied condition of ill health in population groups, the approach to categorize the determinants on the basis of their mode of operation or distance from the outcome of ill health is considered. This approach originates from the research on the determinants of fertility in the work of Davis and Blake, that, which was in 1956, and also in the works of Poncarts. The introduction of this approach in health sector was through the works of Mosley and Chen, in which they attempted to synthesize a um, model of medical and socioeconomic determinants for child survival. This approach categorizes determinants into two categories, intermediate variables, which have biological link to the outcome variable of interest, and the background variables, which operate through the intermediate variables. Intermediate variables being more direct in their effect have also been referred to as proximate determinants. These variables are most open to medical interventions. The background variables signify the social context of ill health. This figure illustrates, highlights the determinants of reproductive morbidity. Well, the medical risk factors are the general health condition or the vulnerability status of a woman. Vulnerability is affected by exposure to nutritional infections and other morbidities. These are correlated with reproductive morbidity in a collective and interactive manner. The vulnerability status can be measured through biological data which is provided by the level of anemia and anthropometric indicators or through medical history information which consists of cumulative reproductive health experience and general health conditions such as hypertension and diabetes. However, measuring these factors in the field setup may not be easy. Moving one step in reverse, the block of intermediate factors is shown which include variables such as women's childbearing pattern, use of health services and health-related practices which have an effect on the susceptibility. A woman's childbearing pattern depends upon her age at time of childbearing, the number of pregnancies and births, and the space between consecutive births. The prevalence of reproductive morbidity is higher in the early and late childbearing years and it increases with the number of pregnancies and births and with shorter birth intervals as indicated by the studies. The degree of a woman's use of health services during pregnancy at the time of delivery and in postpartum period becomes an essential aspect to avoid maturity of complications and health-related problems associated with childbearing. Use of services by women for gynecological and general health care is equally important for controlling reproductive morbidity. This depends heavily on her perception of requirement of facilities and health services and also on the availability, accessibility and quality of the services. Well, reproductive morbidity is associated and interrelated to intermediate variables, background variables, and medical risk factors. The likelihood of a woman suffering from reproductive morbidity is affected on a large scale by the health-related behaviors, especially during pregnancy. A woman's diet, her workload, especially physical work, and her personal hygiene practices are important factors. Also, very significant aspects regarding reproductive tract infections are women's sexual activity or the partner's sexual health activities. Now let us discuss about the models of morbidity analysis. Following are the key concepts and models used in morbidity analysis. The medical model. It had its origin in the establishment of germ theory as the foundation for modern scientific medicine. This view highlights the existence of evidently recognized clinical symptoms 
reflecting the certainty that illness is responsible for the existence of biological pathology. Thus, illness is considered as a state which involves the presence of distinct symptoms and health is regarded as a negative residual condition reflecting the absence of symptoms. The study by Frund and Mikwer in 1999 highlighted that the medical model believes in a dichotomy between the mind and body where the diseases are supposed to be positioned within the body. The philosophical foundation for this dichotomy between the mind and body outweighs to discard this division of the person in the two parts that is the mind and the body. However, the practical foundation is probably lying in medicine's shift to a focus on clinical observation towards the end of the 18th century and on the pathological anatomy from the beginning in the 19th century. This notion indicates that body can be understood and treated as a separate identity from other aspects of the person who inhabits it. The body, according to the medical perceptive, is considered as docile and can be used for the purpose of observation, manipulation, transformation and improvement by the physicians. Now let us see the functional model. A second approach to define health and illness is the functional model. This model emphasizes that health and illness is a sign of level of social normality rather than physical normality of an individual. The functional model is deep rooted to give conceptualizations of health and illness rather than professional ones. In this approach, the diagnosis of a disorder is met by a social group based on societal criteria rather than the clinical criteria. The treatment is then done in order to restore an affected individual's social normality. The individual in this approach is considered as healthy and cured when that individual is able to resume with the social functioning normally and not when the clinical signs of the disorder disappears. Now let us see the psychological model. This model is also referred to as the stress model. This is the, till now the most subjective one out of the three models of health and illness. In this model, the determination of health and illness is done by the individuals themselves. Therefore, the basis of this model is self-evaluation of health and illness by the individuals. So, if the person feels fit, he is considered fit and when he feels sick, he is considered as sick. Furthermore, the affected individual will only determine whether they have been cured of their illness or not. This approach emphasizes on the significance of stress and individual tags which leads to production of sickness. According to this approach, maturity of the physical illness is a reaction to the stress which the individual goes through. Now let us see the legal model. The final model, that is the legal model, applies to communicable diseases and mental illness. The legal model is applied in the cases where the capability of the individual is in question. For example, during the spread of the Ebola virus in 2014, the importance of communicable disease control was a matter of grave concern. This led to formulation of a legal definition of morbidity. Public health authorities have a major role to play in the scenarios for controlling contagious diseases and these authorities are responsible for declaring health emergencies which may lead to restrictions in travel and other social interactions, all for repressing the cause and effect of the communicable diseases. Next, we have the biopsychosocial model. George L. Angel in his work explained that many factors interact together to give rise to health and ill health conditions and gave a model called the biopsychological model of disease in 1977. 
This model takes into consideration some factors which contribute to health and illness of an individual and argues that taking only the biological factors to explain health and illness is not sufficient. It is important to understand the psychological and social factors along with the biological factors. The understanding of the interaction of all these factors will help in better understanding of the causes, manifestation, cause and outcome of health and disease. According to this model proposed by Angel, ill health is not caused individually by the effect of biological or social or psychological factors, but the combined effect of all these factors is responsible for this orientation of health of a person. Let us see the different kinds of measurements of morbidity. As explained in the earlier section, morbidity refers to the diseases, illness, injuries, and disabilities in a population. It refers to the number of people in a population who are ill. Morbidity measures can be used to describe the period of illness which the ill people experience or the duration of these diseases. Data procured from populations on the frequency and distribution of illness can help in controlling the spread of these diseases and may also lead to identification of the possible causes of these diseases. Surveillance systems and sample surveys are the major methods for obtaining morbidity data. However, these methods are very costly and require a greater manpower for efficient data collection. Therefore, they are used selectively in developing countries only to gather data on health problems of extreme importance. Measures of morbidity frequency characterize the number of persons in a population who become ill, that is, incidents or are ill at a given time, which is prevalence. Commonly used measures are listed as under. Incidence refers to the occurrence of new cases of disease in a population over a specified period of time. However, some epidemiologists use incidence as the number of new cases in a community, some other consider incidents to be the number of new cases per unit of population. Incidence proportion and incidence rate are two commonly used types of incidence measures. Incidence proportion or risk. Now, a take rate or probability of developing disease or cumulative incidence is used interchangeably for incidence proportion or risk. Incidence proportion is referred to as the proportion of population which was disease-free initially and developed disease became injured or died during a specified period of time. Incidence proportion is a proportion because the person in the numerator, those who develop disease, are all included in the denominator as part of the entire population. Now let us discuss the methods for calculating incidence proportion or risk. Number of new cases of disease or injury during a specified time, size of the population at the start of a period. Secondary attack rate. In the epidemic situation, the term attack rate is frequently used as a synonym for incident risk. It is the risk of getting the disease during a specified period. Overall, attack rate, food-specific attack rate, secondary attack rate, etc. can be calculated. Overall, attack rate is the ratio of total number of new cases and the total population. A food-specific attack rate is the number of persons who became ill by eating a specific food item divided by the total number of persons who ate that food. A secondary attack rate is calculated to understand and note the difference between community transmission of illness versus transmission of illness in a household or other closed population. It is calculated as number of cases among contexts of primary cases into 10n by the total number of contexts.
Now let us see incidence rate or person time rate. Incidence rate or person time rate is generally calculated from a long-term cohort follow-up study wherein the enrolled individuals are followed over a period of time and the occurrence of new cases of disease is noted. In this procedure, each person is observed from a specific start time until one of these four aspects are reached, that is, onset of disease, death, drop out of the study, or the end of the study. Similar to incidence proportion, the numerator of incidence weight is the number of new cases which are identified during the period of observation. The denominator is the sum of the time each person was observed, total for all person. The denominator thus re represents total time the population was at risk of and was being observed for the disease. Thus, the incidence rate is the ratio of the number of cases to the total time the population is at risk of disease. Incidence rate equals to the number of new cases of disease or injury during specified period by the time each person was observed totaled for all the person. Let us see what is prevalence. Now, prevalence also referred to as the prevalence rate is the proportion of individuals in a population who suffer from a particular disease at a specified point in time. Prevalence differs from incidence as prevalence includes all cases, both new and the pre-existing ones in the population at a specified time, but incidence only takes into consideration the new cases. Point prevalence refers to the prevalence which is measured at a particular point of time. It is the proportion of individuals with a particular disease on a particular date. Period prevalence refers to the prevalence measured over a specific interval of time. It is the proportion of people with a particular disease at any time during the specified interval. Method for calculating prevalence of disease. Now, all new and pre-existing cases during a given time period multiplied by 10n divided by population during the same time period. Now let us see the method for calculating prevalence of an attribute. Persons having a particular attribute during a given time period into 10 n population during the same time period. The value of 10 n is usually 1 or 100 for a common attribute. For rare attributes and for most diseases, the value of 10 n might be as high as 1,000, 100,000 or even 10 lakhs. Prevalence and incidence are frequently confused as being same. However, prevalence refers to proportion of person who are having a condition at or during a particular time period, while incidence refers to the proportion or rate of people who have developed a condition during a particular time period. Thus, prevalence includes new and pre-existing cases, whereas incidence includes new cases only. The difference is in their numerators. Numerator of incidence equals to new cases that occur during a given time period. Numerator of prevalence equals to all cases present during a given time period. The numerator of, in, of an incidence proportion or rate consists of people who became ill during the specified time interval, while the numerator for prevalence takes all the individuals who were ill from a specified cause during the specified interval, irrespective of the time of the beginning of the illness. Incidence as well as duration of illness is the basis of prevalence. High prevalence of a disease within a population reflects high incidence and or long-standing survival without cure. On the other hand, low prevalence will indicate low incidence and a fatal process of recovery from disease. 
Prevalence rather than incidence is often measured for chronic diseases such as diabetes or osteoarthritis because these diseases have later age of onset and have longer duration of servicing as an ailment. Now, what is morbidity versus mortality? Morbidity refers to the detrimental state of an individual, while mortality refers to the state of being mortal. Both these concepts are applicable at the individual level or at the population level. For instance, morbidity rate estimates the incidence of a disease in a population and or geographic location in a single year, while mortality rate will give the rate of death in that population. The word morbid is associated with sickness, illness, and disease. Morbidity as a concept can be applied onto an individual entity. Example, someone with, cardiovas someone with cardiovascular disease or to a population in particular or as a whole in the form of a morbidity rate. For example, the incidence of malaria in a population. There is also a concept called comorbidity, which is when two or more illnesses affect an individual at the same time. For example, dysentery is comorbid with seasonal flu. The rate of morbidity varies depending on the type of the disease. Diseases which are highly contagious may lead to high morbidity rate in a population, while diseases which are non-contagious may affect the individuals only. Morbidity rates facilitate doctors, public health officers, and scientists to calculate the disease risk and make recommendations in public health matters. Consequently, growth death rate is the total number of deaths in a year per thousand individuals. This measure of mortality may be used to document how many people have died across the globe in a particular year. Crude death rate is very often paired with crude birth rate, which estimates the number of people born in a year. This pairing helps in keeping an estimate on the total living human population as well as the population of death in the world. There are various kinds of mortality rates to estimate the rate of human deaths in the world as the death rate may be affected by economic well-being, the incidence of illness in that particular population, age, gender, etc. Some of the mortality measures are maternal mortality rate, which is the annual number of female deaths per 100,000 live births caused due to complication in pregnancy or during the period of childbearing. Infant mortality rate is calculated as the number of deaths of children aged less than one year per thousand live births. Age-specific mortality rate is an estimate of the total number of deaths in a particular age group. It is a ratio of number of deaths of people in a specific age group to the total number of people in that age group. These mortality rates indicate towards the health of the entire world and give an insight into the global health and well-being of populations across the globe. Morbidity is estimated to determine the severity of disease and the need for proper and systematic medical intervention. It can also be used to predict disease risk and make comparisons of patient illness and the outcomes in various hospitals and medical setups. Standardized disease classification systems such as the EPAC K2, SEPS2, and Glasgow Coma Scale are some of the many standardized disease classification systems which have enabled doctors throughout the world to offer science-based care to the patients. Similar to morbidity, mortality can also be scored or predicted with the help of scoring systems like SEPS3, BIM2, and so forth, which suggest ways for predicting the mortality of a patient in intensive care in a realistic manner. Scoring and predicting mortality facilitate hospitals and care units in improving the treatment from year to year. 
due to poor reporting standards in less developed and developing countries, gathering critical and reliable statistical data for mortality and morbidity is a tedious task. However, it is advisable to collect information associated with morbidity and mortality as this may lead to improvement in life quality all over the globe. Now let us summarize this module. From the above module, it is clear that morbidity is very different from mortality, although the two terms are often used together or interchangeably. Morbidity is an estimate of the level of sickness and disability in a population, and it has helped the researchers to understand the concept of sickness and death. Morbidity can be measured objectively as well as subjectively. Calculation of morbidity level in the total population and estimation of morbidity in the subsets of the population are important to study the pattern of morbidity in a population. A few models have been discussed above which help in morbidity analysis in different scenarios and situations. The morbidity measures are used to describe the period of illness and the duration of these diseases. It is important to measure morbidity because the assessment helps the demographers to understand the distribution and frequency of illness, disease which further help in designing health programs. It also leads to identification of the cause of occurrence of diseases. Certain methods are used by the developed countries to obtain morbidity data. However, these methods are costly and cannot be practiced in countries with limited sources in terms of economy as well as manpower. That's all for this module. Thank you so much for listening.